Well, you're most welcome to this talk. Now, I've been thinking lately about groupthink and how things have gone so wrong in so many areas in the Western world all at the same time. Um, and I'm going to talk about that from a slightly academic point of view later on. But but for now, I want, I want to, it's not really academic because it applies to everything, as I think you'll see. But I want to stick to a paper at the moment just to keep us firmly rooted. And this is the paper uh, here. Uh, amid growing evidence of conflicts of interest and obdurate groupthink, immovable groupthink or difficult to move groupthink, in medical journals, uh, researchers must entertain contrarian ideas. And this is by Raphael Latasta and Peter Parry. Um, Peter Parry, the well-known uh, psychiatrist, of course, who I've talked to personally a few times. Fascinating guy. Now, um, let me just tell you what this is about and then you can decide if you want to listen. So uh, mainstream medicine, like other academic fields, is shaped by prevailing paradigms and the dominant narratives they create, particular ways of thinking, create narratives and everyone basically has to obey them. We're kind of in a dictatorial situation here, uh, politically, potentially, academically, certain, certainly, and other things we'll see. Over the past half century, these paradigms have increasingly reflected the growing commercial influence of the pharmaceutical industry. So you'll get the example that this article, a very well worded article, I must say, is talking about. Dominant narratives are closely tied to groupthink to which medical journals are often subject. In addition, more prestigious, in inverted commas, medical journals tend to have further financial conflicts of interest with the pharmaceutical industry. Conflicts of interest, never good, of course. We want transparency and the appearance of transparency. These dynamics limit scientific progress by suppressing awareness of the eitrogenic aspects of industry products. In other words, scientific progress is not made because side effects and adverse events are not always fully um, discussed, shall we say. And of course, these can include deaths, obviously. It does include deaths. Uh, and the benefits of uh, alternative, non-patentable, unpatentable medical, medical products and thera therapeutic interventions is basically ignored. So, in other words, we've got the harms done by the pharmaceutical industry. We won't, we won't talk about that one too much. Just... just, just Keep quiet on that one. But all these other things that can't be patented, well, they can be actively suppressed. The list is long. We've looked at many on this channel. Vitamin D, for example, and many other things we've looked at. Journals need to adopt a more open policy to manuscripts that encompass contrarian perspectives. This is how science progresses. To dominant narratives while still adhering to time-tested scientific values and methods. In other words... If something's patently gobbledygook, if it's scientifically impossible, then okay, pass on. But if it's at least remotely feasible, then these things should be discussed. This is how science progresses. Anyway, let's look at some of the, um, the specifics from this article, and you'll see it really is quite interesting. So some of this comes from Thomas Klung. Now, he wrote this book here. I think this was published in 1962 from memory. Uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, yeah, 50th anniversary, um, I think it was 62 it first came out, basically saying that, you know, the status quo will go on and it will go on and go on till it's intolerable, can't be tolerated, then all of a sudden there'll be a revolution. Everyone will realise. Who knows, maybe mRNA vaccines could be an example of this, amongst many other things um, that have been pretty well disastrous from the pharmaceutical industry as well. Uh, scientific endeavour is subject to paradigms that restrict the ideas that are considered valid. So there's particular ways of thinking. And anything that falls out of this particular way of thinking, uh, let's say the way I think, or the way an important person thinks, well, we can't consider anything else. It's ridiculous. It's outside of my paradigm. Not valid. The arrogance of that is incredible. Let's hope we never fall prey to such arrogance. Scientific and peer-reviewed literature influenced by groupthink um, processes by a, uh, as, by as, sorry, what this is saying is scientific and peer-reviewed literature is influenced by groupthink processes as much as by dispassionate ra rationality. 
So we should be dispassionate, we should be rational, but what this what these authors are saying is that groupthink is just as big a influence on scientific progress. That's what they're saying. And they talk about science, which of course is good, where the science, that is, listen mate, I'm the science, you just do as I tell you because I'm a scientist. That's the science, that's, that's outrageous arrogance, completely unacceptable. Whereas science, of course, is the attempts of human beings to understand the nature of external reality. So we don't want the science, we do want science. That's the way it works. Groupthink theories can be vociferously held and enforced with brutal censorship. So vociferously held. So Nicholas Copernicus, for example, around about 1500, um, I think he died about 1530, something like that, I can't quite remember. Anyway, he had this outrageous idea that the sun was at the centre of the solar system and the earth went round about the sun. Preposterous. Ingan Philippe Semmelweis, another one that we've looked at on this channel, um, said that puperial fever was caused by pure uh, bad hygiene from doctors. This is ludicrous. Doctors are there to cure disease. How can, how can doctors possibly be causing disease? This is ridiculous. And when he told people to wash their hands in chlorinated lime and boric acid solution, the doctors refused. They were doing post-mortems in the morning, carrying the streptococcus from the dead patients to the living patients. Semmelweis realised this, but was ostracised because he threatened vested interests. The doctors were doing very well out of their trade. Thank you very much. We don't want to be told that we're causing deaths. Just imagine that. Doctors causing deaths. It's unthinkable, isn't it? If only it uh, were. So some examples there from history. Conflicts of interest. Pooh pooed them. Don't want to don't want to know. Don't want not too interested in the science. Conflicts with our interests. Considered misinformation merchant in his time, this is Samuel Weiss. He is now an icon of medical science innovation and courage. <laughs> That's not a bad thing to have on your tombstone, is it? An icon of uh, medical science innovation. And unfortunately, to have these things these days, you also need courage. During the past half century, the profitability of large pharmaceutical companies has enabled them to dispense uh, enormous financial investments in two. So who are they paying? Research. Deciding what research is done. Deciding... Oh, I almost said deciding what the results of the research were. There, 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 nearly slip, slip, near slip of the tongue there. Um, as importantly, of course, deciding what research is not done. Universities, so research, compromise. Universities, compromise. Medical education, compromise. I should really make these crosses, shouldn't I? This is bad. Medical journals, compromised. Uh, political parties, compromised. Drug regulators, say no more. Medical colleagues and associates, associations, yes. And supranational organisations such as the World Health Organisation. Could these be influenced by pharmaceutical funding? They can create, that's the medical uh, pharmaceutical industry, they can create the medical groupthink consensus. They can track the way of thinking ahead incorporating their own ideas, excluding other ideas. Internal pharmaceutical industry documents released in litigation from criminal trials, where the industry has been fined 122 billion since the year 2000. 122 billion in fines. And of course, the only things you get fined for are the things you get caught for. Obviously, we're not saying those other things as well, but you know, we can say the things you get fined for are the things you get caught for. Um, I've revealed companies invest in uh, shaping narrative to dominate a particular medical field in favour of their products. Underestimating harms, overestimating benefits. Don't have to think too far for an example there, safe and effective. Conflicts of interest now bedevil every level of pharmaceutical medical science, according to the article, the journal that we're considering, article journal, peer review that we're considering. Pharmaceutical companies tend to oversee the trials of their own products. What could possibly go wrong? 
Large pharmaceutical companies provide the majority of funding to the regulators. Asked with considering the evidence of clinical trials and granting or denying licenses. So the pharmaceutical companies tend to oversee their own trials and they put a few bob in the way of the uh, regulators as well. Not that that influences their outcomes in any way, of course. We're not implying that in any way, shape or form. Uh, a few journal, a few journal chief editors have stated that their publications are effectively part of Big Pharma's marketing departments. Now, let's just look at a few examples here because uh, I don't want to give you any of my opinions. I just want to relate what is uh, externally true. So, evidence for this here, uh, this journal here, industry-sponsored clinical trials are broken system, and that's from JAMA, which isn't known for its uh, outrageous contrarian views normally. Um, BMJ, Medical Journals and Pharmaceutical Companies, Uneasy Bedfellows, I would have thought so. Um, what's that one? Cookies. Uh, medical journals are an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. Interesting article title. Medical journals are an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. I think we probably could go on. Pharmaceutical companies advertising in the Lancet. Payments by US pharmaceuticals and medical devices manufacturers to US medical journal editors. Retrospective study. Anyway, let, let, let's not jump ahead. So th there's, there's a few references there. Check these out for yourself. Make sure I'm not making it all up. So editors of major medical journals have received payments from large pharmaceutical companies. We've given the evidence for that there. Peer reviewers have also received payment. Evidence for that there. Not that we're saying it's influenced their peer reviewing at all, of course. Payments to pharmaceutical companies uh, made to doctors. Uh, which one is that? Let me see. Um, is that that one? Payment by drug and medical devices manufacturers to US peer reviewers. That's the peer reviewers one of major medical journals, peer reviewers receiving cash, or maybe a bank transfer, who knows. Key opinion leaders in psychiatry, a conflicted pathway to career uh, advancement. Um, and if you actually look at some of the details on these articles, they, they really are, um, they really are quite, quite concerning. Industry payments to journal editors are common and often large particularly for certain subspecialties. Journals should consider the potential impact of such payments on public trust in published research. Sounds reasonable to me. Can't say my trust it as an all-time high. And I know a lot of yours uh, aren't either. So plenty of references there, so you can see I'm not just making all this up, nor are the authors making it up. Industry payments to US physicians by uh, speciality and product type. Industry payments to physicians. Pharmaceutical products recall and education hesitancy towards new drugs and novel vaccines. I mean, we could, we could go on. I'm not going to show you any more of these. It gets a bit boring, but you get, you get the idea. That this has even seeped through to the mainstream literature, is the point I'm making, and the evidence uh, for the author's claims is, uh, is in these articles. Anyway, to carry on, uh, pharmaceutical product recalls are numerous but take years to be actioned, so you can get things out fairly quickly but can't get them back so quick. Medical science is consistently evolving and disagreement is both reasonable uh, and rife. So we should have disagreement. We should have disagreement. So just briefly to finish this particular video, uh, remedies to groupthink. Um, uphold the rights of dissenters to be heard as long as they are consistent with underlying, uh, basic underlying scientific principles, or even if there's a chance that a dissenter might be, right, let's put it out for peer review. Let's talk about it. You know, if you read an article, you don't like it, then you write to the journal and say, oh, this guy's talking gobbledygook, which you're allowed to do. So anyway, uphold the right of dissenters to be heard. Medical journals actively encourage 
the uh, discussion of contrarian ideas, if only. <laughs> so medical journals should actually say, ooh, a lot of people will disagree with that. I'll publish that straight away. That's what should happen, in my view, and in the view of the authors. But it doesn't always happen. In fact, it virtually never happens. Stop punishing dissenters. We've talked to people who've dissented, who've been severely punished on this channel. Address financial and other conflicts of interest. Indulge those uh, occupied with uh, taboo science while still adhering to time-tested scientific principles and methods. So let's indulge these people. Let's indulge Nikolai Copernicus. Let's indulge Philippe Semmelweis. Let's indulge these people. Who knows? They might have something to say. While still adhering to time-tested scientific principles, we know what the basic science is. Scientific principles, not the science. <laughs> Be aware of... Uh, oh, th th this is from the article. I put this in. Um, completely unrelated, really, but I've written, Be aware of manipulating psychopaths and sociopaths. I think that's always true, isn't it? Any situation you're in in life, be aware of manipulating psychopaths and sociopaths because you often don't realise who they are sometimes. Anyway, that, that's completely unrelated to everything else. It's just, just a general tip that as an old, uh, maybe somewhat cynical psychiatric nurse, <laughs> I put in. Be aware of manipulating psychopaths and sociopaths. And the article concludes, something is rotten in the academy. We need to uh, improve. So, rather good article, really quite short, uh, eminently readable. Uh, free download, uh, get it for yourself, um, read it. You can read it in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. A lot of uh, pretty powerful points related to um, groupthink. Now, I'm going to do a bit more on groupthink, but I think I'll just leave that for another video because I've gone on for long enough for now. So uh, come back in the next one and we'll look at um, a little more on groupthink and some of the disasters it's generated throughout history. But for now, thank you for watching.